Sexism in Stargate. And if you want, you can get closer. Because this is going to be a nice intimate panel where we can all talk to each other because it's not just about us. It's about what you guys think of the situations in Stargate as they are presented. And just as a quick introduction, um, I'll be essentially a moderator person. I'm Karen and I'm on staff here. And to my left is the lovely and talented Mary. Hey guys, I'm Mary. I run a blog called Mary Lou Who. And uh, I'm just here to help facilitate conversations. Absolutely. About the ladies of Stargate. So our focal thought for this, as seen in our lovely trifle, pick one up if you want for a souvenir, is do female characters get slighted in the SG franchise or well, some of the now cliche dialogue and plot in an attempt to move gender equality forward. So that's kind of where we're going to be looking at that through the different franchises and talking about some of the characters there, what they represented. So, how do you want to kick this off? Hmm. Well, I think Sam Carter is an obvious place to okay. begin. Um, I think she is she experiences a lot of sexism among the gentlemen of Stargate Command, at least at first. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that I think that they have anybody, perhaps also, just being really <coughs> cautious of who's going to be on their team and who you're going to trust and all that. I mean, there's you know the whole reproductive organ conversation. So yes, the uh, famous the quote. <laughs> They're on the inside, but I could still do this. <coughs> oh no, where's my pen? Grab my pen. Okay. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, we do still have a few pens over here. Um, I believe what we have left is Command and Warrior. So you can be all commandy or you can be all fight about it. <laughs> so. And look, we have a new player. Right. You made it. it. I did make it. So we'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself in just one moment and get comfy up here. We are talking about the character of Sam Carter in light of sexism in Stargate. My name is my name is Kenton Spivey. Uh, I'm a Doctor Who aficionado, I guess. I run a convention in Florida called Time Lord Fest. I also play in the Kenton Spivey Band or Doctor Who Band. So that's my introduction. Sam Carter in light of sexism. Do, do we already discuss in the early seasons her development as a, a character uh, how she tried to fill overly <coughs> traditional uh, empowered feminine roles in the early seasons by saying that she is a strong empowered woman who's more than just her reproductive organs. We were just at that point. There you go. <laughs> <coughs> then I came in at the right time. Exactly. So what do you guys think about that? Do you think in the early seasons she was an empowered character because she said so? I think that's a very real situation in a workplace like that, where if you're constantly treated in a demeaning way, you sort of have to remind people not to do that. And sometimes it takes your words and not just you know carrying yourself. So, I mean, it's unfortunate <coughs> that she, the, the character has to say, no, I can do this, I'm independent and I'm empowered, but I think it's necessary both in the context of the show, because it happens in a real workplace, and in the context of the audience, because, you know, maybe they're not necessarily used to that, especially since the early seasons were, um, what, on Showtime? Mm -hmm. So the other women on the show were fairly close. That does tend to try to change your understanding a bit about what a strong female character is. One that has clothes or no clothes. <laughs> <laughs> or can you be both? Because, hey, okay. people pull it off. It's difficult with any abstract concept such as uh, strength, femininity, religion, to get that across properly. And the best parallel I can think of uh, for the uh, her situation would be uh, using the words of St. Francis of Assisi, who said, spread the wor uh, words of Christ and sometimes use, uh, spread, <coughs> spread the words of Christ and sometimes uh, use words, meaning your actions need to do it. Instead of religion, let's replace that with uh, uh, 
power and feminine strength. Her words meant less than her actions. So over time, she proved her strength by keeping up with the team and sometimes outdoing the team and being the one who is their savior. So I would say the question there to some extent is, was that a response to the sexism in the show itself or a response to sexism that would be expected in a workplace like that? Given the command structure, the military aspect and all those things. Mary? I'm looking back there because she has my coffee. And I love <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's a really it's a very um, male dominated show for the most part. I mean, there's she's really. Thank you. You're my new favorite. I am. Here, she put yours. Mine are yours. Oh, okay. Thank you. Cash. Cash Give me my money. Oh, she's already good. <laughs> um, <Got you. laughs> So anyway, as, as, and you're right. All the other women on the show are pretty, pretty scantily clad, and everyone else is a man. Yeah. Go ahead. Th thank you for having this panel. And next time, let's do it when everybody's still here. Uh, <laughs> Careful, um, who, who are the writers? Were the writers male, or primarily, were any of them female? Were any of the writers female? The first female uh, writer that they had was. So that, that's the answer right there. I don't, you don't need to look at anything else. But is that the presumption they that only women can, only women can write female writers. characters they well? They left the women out as writers. The writers decide what happens, not the actors, and even not the audience unless we refuse to watch. So as long as you don't have women writing from a women's point of view, even about men, we're going to get we're stuck with the sexist world. So. But yes and no. I, I do too. Go next door. To the weed track and see the okay, track but track. to be fair, John's had Jane and other people write for him too. I didn't say that. I just said. All right, so we have a hand up here. Having worked in uh, both EMS Rescue, which is very male dominated, and also having contracted with the military and worked closely with civilians and military personnel, sometimes that's actually it's cringing, but sometimes it's accurate because you just get finally have to say, look, I can do it just, and I, in EMS we get kind of vulgar with our language, but, you know, I've got to, I can grow up here for you if I need to. <laughs> That's very true. And I, yeah, I, I've had to, point, I've done that with several partners and we became great friends, but you do have to prove that you're one of, you can be one of the guys. Yeah, I work at a, I work at a car dealership and, you know, it's predominantly male. Yeah. Like, uh, I work in customer relations and there's me and one other young woman who works in that department. And pretty much everyone else in the dealership is a man. And so when we have a customer that we need to get help with, we get blown off a lot because we're, I think it's yeah. because we're younger women and they just don't, yeah, you know, there's no reason for them to help us. So yeah. a lot of times you have to get that way. You have to have an attitude and then they respect you for it later. Yeah. And I was 19, starting off as an EMT at 19, which is uh, youngest allowable in the state of Alabama. So... I had to go ahead and prove that yes, I could keep up with the guys physically and emotionally, you know, not break down over stuff, have to keep my emotions in check, even though, you know, maybe running a, a 18 month old full cardiac arrest or something like that, but be able to, you know, stay on par. And it got to points where I uh, would get done with the rescue, take my helmet off. That's a woman. There's a break. She's. She's got, that's a woman? And I was the one, you know, yeah, the woman was the leader and in charge of this one. And that was also when I became advanced to a crew leader and had my own crew. Other departments who didn't know who was in charge, they would go straight to one of the males off the truck. It's like, Oops. yeah, no, she's our boss today, so you need to coordinate with her. And, and also I think had, that's, yeah, that's yeah. a really good way of looking at it. You know, it takes a while to get people's respect. But once you do, you got it. And even now, like, yeah. you know, they're like, no, 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 it's her, really. Yeah. It's her, yeah. And once I got the respect, yeah, they, yeah. Once I could prove it, then, oh yeah, they, they would, you know, stand up for me with against other departments. And so, I think that Sam it, definitely does that too. A lot in later seasons. Yeah. And you, no one really questions. Oh, why are we listening to this bleach blonde female chick? Right. But a yeah. lot of the alien races still do. There are yeah. many, many episodes where the rest of SG-1 has to say, 
No, she's part of the team. Yeah. She's our scientist. So it's it's accurate, it's cringe worthy, but I don't think people realize just how accurate that sometimes is in the real world, especially in very traditionally macho, not just male dominated, but very macho uh, role that there is. There was something that was said earlier that uh, that while most of the women were skinny <coughs> in class, Sam was uh, a strong female. Well, those handily well, clad women, I'm sure, felt powerful. Yeah. And I'm sure that uh, he, their sexuality, she, they had found through the course of their life that that was an effective means to an end as well. Yeah. And so we should not diminish that and form also, of feminine yeah. power as well. And also, um, once became accepted amongst the other members of the rescue squad, mm -hmm. I, you know, we worked 12 hour shifts, so we'd spend them, you know, not day or, not, or night together. So. Yeah, at night, shorts, sleeveless t-shirt, trying to get cool in Alabama weather in the summer. And that became less of an issue. You know, she's not afraid to go ahead and you know, show some skin when you know one of my partners is coming out of the bathroom wearing a towel and nothing else. So I had to get used to a certain amount of familyness too. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah, you gotta see your brother wearing less than you'd like to, but that's just the way it is. Do we have someone in the back? Yes, there was a hand. Uh, oh, I was just going to say, in the very early episodes, there was when she went to the planet and they forced her to put on their dress. Yeah, uh, and mm -hmm. emancipation. And, yeah. you know, yes, course, that was a lovely outfit, though. I just yeah, but all, all the males <laughs> on the team are reacting like, holy crap, look at this. But I appreciated that Carter's reaction to it was, you have to be kidding me. I can't believe I have to do this. Because I feel like that's, that's what my reaction would be. Yeah. Yeah, I would be. I I don't know that I would deal well with going somewhere and having to dress a certain way because I'm a woman. I think I would have argued with that, and I appreciate that Sam does as well. Well, you think as an archaeological team, though, they'd understand that uh, those things do happen, and you know, like when Oprah goes to the third world, she's like, "What do you mean I have to eat bad food all day?" <laughs> uh, yeah. it, it's it's going to happen. That's true. So uh, I, men might have to go to a planet. We all have to paint ourselves blue. Like, what do you mean blue? It's not my color. Well, you're going to have to do it if you're going to be in the world of anthropology and archaeology. These are things that you're going to have to do. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like when people have, go on contracts to Afghanistan and Iran, Iraq, places like that, where you know they, they don't always think about it ahead of time. But I mean, frequently women do have to be veiled, and that's Western women. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's not always optional. <laughs> you don't always get a waiver. I think that episode really was new for them. That was the mm -hmm. first time they'd been to a, a planet really with such a different culture where they had to adjust the way that they go about things in order to function in that society. And I think after that they, you know, they do a lot better with it, but for that first time it was surprising. So we can establish, I think, for the most part, that Sam is at heart a strong female, self-evidently, even without her having to tell us about it. But does that let them off the hook for only having pretty much one for most of SG-1. Well, it's, it's originally uh, science fiction, traditionally, until probably the last 15, 18 years, has been a, a, mostly a male-dominated genre. And men like, unfortunately, men like looking at women, and we identify with men. And it's an unfortunate uh, generalization, but it's a slight truism. So I, I can see myself well in uh, Richard Dean Anderson. I can't see myself well in uh, Inara from, from uh, Firefly. I just can't. So it makes sense that there's so many male characters for the initial intended audience to identify with. That's why later shows, they have more and more female characters because you're getting a larger female audience for those people to identify with. Okay. Do you guys agree? Um, we have a hand. First hand, second hand, third hand. <laughs> yes, thank you. That was a great comment, sir, because a lot of the sexism is the way that men have such a narrow definition of what it means to be human. And the trouble with Stargate is that it is in a military context, mostly. And if a man who wasn't military, Daniel, he gets a lot of crap for, for being outside of this very narrow uh, what it means to be a man. Mm -hmm. That's and an excellent point. Until I mean, he thinking, bolts up and kind of works out a little bit later on. Like having a brain is considered it's weird, you know? Mm -hmm. Planning, uh, 
noticing details of the enemy, quote, not treating everybody like the enemy. Daniel is, to me, one of the, one of the more interesting characters, along with what was, uh, I'm really, at my age, names are coming in and out like crazy, I apologize. Um, the woman who became Daniel's uh, mind switch <laughs> later on. Uh, not Bala. The one who kicked all the butt from, uh, from uh, Farscape. Bala. Yeah, Bala Maldoran. Yeah. Who's Bala? Bala. I mean, Bala and Daniel were sort of, to me, the more and androgynous of the two, and shows how it's not hard to do. And they're much more fun characters. Mm -hmm. Because you never know who's going to start the fight or who's going to end the argument. You know, I mean, when, when women start an argue, a verbal argument, you know they're going to win you know, on the TV show. After men start a physical argument, you know he's going to win that. Boring. Not necessarily. Pretty much. Taylor can kick your butt. Fair? Yes. <laughs> Well, you yeah, there are exceptions, I'm just saying, as a rule. So what I like to think is that, and there are, but there's a lot of science fiction by women mm -hmm. that completely changes the aliens you meet. The aliens have a, um, a uh, non-patriarchal culture, which we can't somehow imagine, because we've wiped them out in our, in our country even. Uh, I mean, those cultures are really dangerous if you have women even as equal. There's archaeological proof that when they found the Egyptians, for example, the women and the men were equal. And what the, what the French did when they found it, they destroyed all of the female genitalia so nobody would know that the women had equal status. Now that's very, now that could have been used as one of the storylines, but they, the writers chose not to know this. And I'm not even well, it's also kind of awkward bringing up on a sci-fi show women's genitalia in such a detailed way. Well, I'm just saying <laughs> so it's, it's perhaps it's that not. was not the direction they wanted to take it in to keep it from going there. Well, well, why do you think they put her in different clothes? They wanted up to ratings. Well, well something That's that we're not put it in women's something we're not addressing is that this show does not take place outside of our time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This began some time ago. Stargate's been on for it had a ten-year run. Uh, Atlantis was it four or five years? Five, five, five years. Yeah. Uh, Universe two yeah. years. That's a long time. Philosophically, there's been according to uh, feminine theory, there have been three waves of feminism the past one hundred years. The first wave came after uh, came before and during World War One. It was a very traditional uh, form of uh, of femininity. Then in World War Two, we were given a uh, second wave feminism much reflected by the Rosie the Riveter concept of a woman, where she is strong and she'll tell you that she's strong. Later theorists have claimed that we have entered into a third wave of, uh, of feminism, which has only happened in the last about 12 to 15 years, where a woman can show how strong she is by selecting any gender role she so desires. She doesn't have to be the strong woman. She can be a weak woman. It's the power she can, of choice. She, the power of choice. Well, this show began in the second wave of feminism where she had to say out loud, I am a strong woman. And it ended in the, in the cusp of the third wave of feminism where uh, feminine power has become more fluid and has become more free. So that's where we can kind of actually segue that into Vala as a character description. And precisely. Vala could not have existed in the early series, at least well. Yeah. And I think a lot of that comes out in the universe as well. I mean, all the characters in the universe are so much more fluid than the ones that are in at least the beginning of SG-1. Um, and they all have, I mean, they have a lesbian couple and that, that would have never been on SG-1. Jesus, that would have gone badly. <laughs> but, um... It would have been handled. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was showtime, what do you want to... Yeah. <laughs> Did you make hand up? Oh, we had one in the front yeah. a minute ago. I uh, the beginning of SG-1 just reflected also the military culture of the time. You have a group of specialists and such. There's, you know, maybe will be only one or two women, you know, maybe one or, you know, less than one percent of, you know, people will be a female just and because that was the type the time. And there's a lot more discussion about are we allowing women in combat at that yeah. point too. That was a big deal. Yeah, and she, yeah, she had to prove that, yes, she had served in a, in the first Gulf War, she did have, she is a combat veteran in addition to her science, pursuing her science. So, no, I'm a real Air Force officer. I'm not just, you know, 
handed the, you know, the, you know, my stripes just because I happened to get through college. No, I earned it. I did earn. I am a pilot. I am military. In addition to being a scientist, and you're just not going to find that many people, you know, people in general, that much less women, especially in the mid '90s. So I think it's a an accurate reflection of what you would end up getting in the real world at the time. I believe, as you said, with your career choice, you, yeah. you uh, can give a very empathetic, uh, you're very empathetic to what these people were going through, the women, yeah. because uh, you're going through something so similar. Yeah, it, and about 50 people at, at any one time, and maybe at most five women, and the women tend to drop out. I was in for 12 years at the rest of the and that was the longest any woman had been active. And I was one of the first women to become and hang out long enough to get through all the training and become a full crew leader. Did that make uh, allow you to uh, relate even better to Sam as he watched yeah, the show? Yeah, it, it did. Because yeah, because like I said, I started out watching Stargate when I, I was 20 when it came on, something like that. And I was the young one, of the second youngest officer elected to the, our executive board of directors. The, Youngest was uh, elected the same year, and he was six months younger than not my, than me. And neither of us could legally drink yet. <laughs> but I'm having to go to meetings with you know, city officials, the chief of the fire department, going instead of our executive president who had to work. I was in college, so my schedule was more flexible. You know, and and oh, you're Paul's secretary? No, I'm not Paul's secretary. I'm the executive secretary of the. I have the gold badge. I'm an actual officer. I'm not his secretary. I'm the executive secretary of the board of directors. I am a genuine officer. And I get that all the time. People come in my office. They're like, "Is Rick here?" I'm like, <coughs> "Bitch, Rick, Rick works next door to me." Yeah. I'm not his secretary. I don't know where he is. Yeah, I'm Rick's mother. Of, of the first <laughs> oh, time you must be his girlfriend. I'm like, Jesus. We just work in the same hallway. Yeah. <laughs> the first time I had to command an actual search and rescue, and I was the highest ranking rescue squad member there. I was the only officer present. Previous officer, he was there. He was, hadn't been reelected. He served as my advisor for me. He understood that you know, you're new at having to command an entire land search area over about 10 square mile area. So I'll give you the advice, but I understand you are in charge of this and I'll support you on that. So yeah, I thank Paul very much for that, for supporting. What I'm hearing is that uh, Sam allowed you to relate to the show very yeah. well. Um, and I'm curious, did you relate well to the original movie or not until the show did, did I, I connect? liked the original movie, uh, kind of its eye candy. And mm -hmm. then when I saw that it was coming out of the series, uh, that's why we got sh uh, Showtime at the first place. It's like you gotta get it, and I did like that they did have a good, uh, realistic female character because she was you know, the comment that she made on the infamous line is a less vulgar version of ones that I had to make in front of even two officers at the time. Well, let's try this. Some of the other uh, women in the audience. Uh, did, well, she's did, had her hand up oh, for a while. Now. I, I gotta see you there. Sorry, I just wanted to speak to the casting as well. You were saying, do we need to be upset that there's only one woman? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a it's a very small cast for a side question. Yeah. And a lot of times you hear SG-1 compared to Star Trek The Next Generation. Right. The cast of seven, but both women are nurturers. Mm -hmm. You have a counselor and a doctor. And Sam's not in that role. She's a physicist. And even though, I mean, it scales down and the ratio stays down. But that motherly aspect, even though she displays it later and not at work, her role is not to be a nurturer. She's a comrade. Yeah, yeah. if you were going to compare the sexism of a next generation to the sexism of Stargate SG-1. <laughs> <laughs> SG-1 wins. Uh, yeah. 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 We win! Yes! <laughs> when people say, like, yeah, if like TNG and try, try SG-1, mm -hmm. but what I'm saying is there's progression there from, mm -hmm. you know, 1987 to, what, 19? We were, we were evolving philosophically as a people. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. So we've talked a lot about SG-1. Maybe we should go on and talk about some of the characters in Atlantis as well. Uh, there's a hand up here. You guys have been talking a lot about Carter, but you totally skipped over Fraser. And at the beginning, True. she That's fair. really had this bit part, but her and Sam later really just kind of meshed. Mm -hmm. 
And for it, I, I don't cry, but I bawled like a baby when she died, and I'm oh, still oh, pissed. <laughs> don't worry, we all did. Yeah, you fast, but not much care for I mean, her. I, I know I'm in the minority. Terror Rock is awesome, but just. You know, and it was like when they did the same thing to Beckett, I was like, come on, really? Well, we had a panel on that yesterday, how all yes. the structures <laughs> <and> die <laughs> in Stargate. Suffrage will stay, but then again, she'll stay, you know. So. Yeah. She always comes out. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I think I think Janet's a great character, and she does definitely change a lot. At the beginning, it's just like, oh, we have to have a doctor because we're a military unit and we get hurt sometimes. Uh, and she happened to be a woman. But I think they really fleshed her out a lot, mm -hmm. and I really appreciated. Um, we talked we talked yesterday about that scene where they uh, have to break out of the uh, <laughs> when ha when Hathor comes and takes over the. Uh, oh, God. The base, and they have to use their wiles to get out of prison. <laughs> I think that that was, I thought it was funny. I loved it. Um, it, it was funny, but um, there's all sorts of, that was, it was not using their sexuality's weapon as much as, it's a great episode to show off ladies. Yeah, pretty yeah, much. That was, <laughs> that was that that was like, pretty much. <laughs> we could talk the entire panel about that episode. There's so many wonderful things that should not have done. There. Yeah. yeah, it would have been a great slash. That would have been about it. I believe there is, if you're interested, that sort of thing out there right now. <laughs> so, um, yes. I don't understand this women using sexuality as a woman. I thought, could you explain what you mean by that? Sure. Bo both sexes are able to use your sexuality as a weapon. Everything is a means to an end. So, uh, your legs are is something that you can use to walk over there. If you're unable to walk over to the door, you can uh, ask somebody, please walk me to the door. If that doesn't work, if that person you realize is slightly attracted to you, you could kind of wink a little bit and say, hey, can you get me to the door? Each one of them is a means to an end to getting to the door. Neither of, neither of the three were bad. They were rather a weapon at your disposal to be able to accomplish your goal. And men don't have that sexuality. Of course we do. Of course oh, yes. we do. If oh, Cliff yes. Simon asked me to help him walk to the door, I am helping him walk to the door. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would hope that you all would help anybody who needed help. No. Uh, to the door. No, we're, we're, we're just. I would be faster just, for Cliff Simon. Well, what do we think about humanity in whatever that thing was? Do we no longer help people? Do we help? Unless. They're sexy? Is that what the message is? It's not it's like a message of exclusion, like we're or not going to help gun? you unless that. That's not the term or the understanding. It's just that those who have that extra weapon in their arsenal are able to use it more okay. effectively than some others. Well, this is a military mindset. Everything is either control as, control is everything. Is that what we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, various Every power dialectics. The not as much as control, as much as power. Well, that's kind of what's at yeah. the root of sexism, really. Yeah. It's control. To no, some extent, it depends so it gets to control no, how females no, express no. themselves, how males express themselves, what's acceptable in each society as we determine it. I actually went to a military school for two and a half years. Part of the reason why it's true now. Can you, can you speak a little for us, deaf people? I, I went to a military college with the intent of commissioning. It didn't happen. I was one of three females in my company. We had probably a hundred people in every company. I was one of three females. I did not have to be a cadet because I was a female. I had the option to live on campus without being a cadet. I made that choice. I have a lot of respect for Carter because I actually identified with her. You know, I was like, oh, you're a female. You're, you're never going to amount to anything. Oh, you, you can't pace yourself in a run. You can max out your push-ups and sit-ups, but you're not good enough. So it was constant, and that's why I love Carter and why I love Razor, because they're both in the military, and they're both female. They're very strong characters. They're not afraid, especially Fraser. I mean, she was a doctor, and she would tell Jack, no, you need to sit back down. <laughs> you, no, you, you are going to listen to me. I don't care that you outrank me. You are going to listen to me. You know, and that that was really nice to see it. A lot of sci-fi, even Star Trek. Although you were wrong, there were three main female characters in the first three seasons. Tasha Yar, 
was a, the strong female I character and yeah. yeah, unfortunately she only lasted half a season. Yeah. 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 Half a season. I think she was too. She was there yeah. for more than half a season. I've yeah. watched them, she, but she died halfway through season one, and she came back for two episodes. Yeah. But the point so is that ta you you had Counselor Choi, who's in this itty bitty miniskirt, even though she was an officer, which was seven and nine when they put her in the bodysuit. They were they were okay with that, <coughs> and later seasons put. Counselor Troy into a counselor's in a Starfleet uniform because they realized, you know what, this isn't cool. She is an officer, she needs that respect. But with Stargate, they never did that. Actually, the official reason why they put Troy in the real uniform is because she lost enough weight. Wow. So they, they put her in that, that low cut uniform because they thought her tummy was too big. So they wanted to draw attention to her breasts. And in later seasons, the, uh, the um, Burning the Service lost enough weight. That they put her in the it's like when O'Brien went on DS9, he's the only officer with an overshirt. <laughs> <laughs> Just FYI. <laughs> so, um, to avoid us getting too sucked far into that other star show, uh, I, we've been talking a lot about the, the militaristic aspects. I do apologize for leaving out Dr. Frazier. I understand. I have erred. But um, let's Excellent. compare that actually to a character more like Dr. Weir. She, who is a different sort of doctor, who's not strictly military, who's being kind of sucked into all this, and may not entirely be ready for it. What do you think of her as a female character having to suddenly say, oh, and I command you military guys too? Well, I would be ready for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there was a little high expectation level on that, wasn't there? Well... I think they had a hard time dealing with that character, even the show creators, and I think that could be seen in her wardrobe. They could not figure out what to put her in that allowed her to look both strong and feminine at the same time. They come up, came up with a casual red blouse, and that's all that she could, they could put her in. And I, I it, think it, it makes was, dry really easy, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, they, they, that was a great reflection of they didn't quite know what to do with her character. Well, she wasn't military but we still need to make her strong, but not too strong. So is she the red blouse? Where they, I don't quite know what to do with her wardrobe. Is that being reflected in her character? I always thought it was. What I thought was interesting with Lear is when she was first introduced on SG-1, she was blonde. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I know she was a different actor. recast. <laughs> the dynamic between her and Colonel O'Neill at the time, butting heads because she's coming in and taking over. At you know, no, we're not going to do the military thing anymore. Where you're still on a military base. Whereas when you went to Atlantis, it was more you had the military, but it was more the scientific exploration. And I th and Doctor Weir is awesome. I I loved her to death because again, a strong female character. There's not enough of that, and it is so frustrating. Because, you know, just because we are girls doesn't mean that we're weak. And just because you're male doesn't mean you're strong. And it just, the whole gender role thing really just needs to go bye bye. Yeah, Rodney McKay, not so strong. Oh, yes, yeah. but I love McKay. You gotta love him too, but um, he is a bit of delicate flower at times. <laughs> well, yes, the gentleman in the hat of many What moments. I liked about her was that she was strong in a way. Remember, she was a mediator. She was because she was like the best mediator on the planet. So who better to send out? That that really made sense. If you're going to go meet other other uh, cultures, you want someone who knows how to build bridges. But when did she use that skill set? I mean, yes, yeah, she when she went to other meeting. cultures, sure, she got to do that. But I think part of the problem yes, was the, uh, the command I mean, issue. I wasn't. I, I have to breathe. I have a breathing problem, so I have to stop some. So I apologize for taking breaths between my sentences. We, we have a, mediators have to do a lot of listening, and they have to do a lot of making sure everybody in the room understands what everybody else said. Because especially when there's military macho people in the room, they're not used to listening to people who don't have all the stars on them. Because who gives a shit what they think? I'm going to do what the other guy, the guy in charge says. So she has the issue of, and that happens even in, in private industry where men are in charge, because I've been through, you know, I've been, I've been a business professor and I 
worked with thousands of businesses as a consultant, installing systems for them. And when the men are in charge, it's my way or the highway. It's not about military. <coughs> it's, about our, it's about our human American culture. So I love that somebody took a mediator who, who mostly had to deal with men not beating each other up and having wars, and now is dealing with the military. I would think that they, that, that was rad, that was so radical, I love that they did it. And she, she needed to, to, uh, it was more like an outpost in a city, you know, it was very true. And I love that show, I'm so sorry she left. When she left, I, I left too. That's how important she was. Well, I just see these mediating powers being used all the time. I saw everybody else use their skill sets, uh, I just, I don't, I don't have any that's great moments in my head. That is a very important thing. I just didn't say it. When did she do it? That's part Every of the meeting problem that, that we have, have there. Go back and watch the meetings they have as a group. Yeah. And you watch it. She's so good, you may not notice it. Okay. Because when you have a commander who's supposed to be leading, <clears throat> that's one of those conflicting things. You can have someone who's supposed to be a mediator who's supposed to listen to all sides, but at the end of the day, the commander has to actually choose what they are going to do for their own reasons. They can entertain what people have to say or not at their discretion, but ultimately they have to make a decision. And I think that was part of the weakness of her character. And not that she's a female, but that that just wasn't, she wasn't at the right job. If she, I think if she had been, say, an officer or somebody like whose official job was diplomat with the units as they went out and did exploration for three Atlantis, I think that would have been a better given, fit. given her temporary rank of some sort, so she actually had some gravitas, would have been fantastic. You've had your hand up for a long time, you haven't spoken yet. Back there in the green? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I think she had a different type of strength. She was uh, good at negotiating. She got to use that when she went to um, talk to the Janai and mm -hmm when she was trying to deal with the replicators. I mean, that didn't work out so well, but she did get to try to do, use her skills in that way. She didn't get to use her skills as often because she didn't go with the teams. She was good at leading and directing. Everyone respected her uh, authority out on the base. It's just that uh, we, did, as an audience, didn't get to see her use her skills to their best advantage as often. Precisely. But when she did, she was really good at it, and I enjoyed seeing that. So we would have liked to see more of Weir in action. I think part of the problem was with Weir, it was just writing, too, because some episodes were great, like 38 minutes. Yeah, she's listening to the ideas, but then she does make the decision, and it's, right. no, you are going to do this. And it seemed to me more of just who was writing the episodes and they couldn't keep a consistent and maybe didn't know how to write a, a excellent diplomat and mediator. Just they hadn't the, didn't have a technical consultant yeah. to help That's them out with that. Point. That's a great point. So they're kind of winging it trying to figure out how how would this work and she would have had an, equi an equivalent military rank. Uh, if they had a consultant from the UN, they could help them out or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but she would have had an equivalent military rank as a civilian um, when I interacted with the military in an official capacity as an officer to rescue squad. I was, at times, up. To, it would vary up to what my rank in the squad was, but at times I was up to a lieutenant colonel equivalent by military protocol just because of the rank I had outside the military. So there, that is in place for civilians mm -hmm. to have an equivalent military rank, at least to be respected as and to be treated as that. Do we have a hand over here? A uh, new case, in fact. Yeah. Um, I was actually going to mention 38 minutes. I think that was like one of her strongest episodes. You hear it early on. You had like an aspect of her where she's listening to everybody and she's listening to Kavanaugh and Simpson and Rowan and she's like, even when Becky asked this question about why can't they just come through the gate and all this stuff, like why isn't the first half of the ship through the gate? She stops to let Grogan explain what that is, and when Becky doesn't understand that, she sums it up. So she's like, she's got all that, you know, listening going on and making sure, like, she knows what's going on in everybody's head. And then she also steps in and she makes a decision, like, she's not going to stop for hauling when he wants to do the, the right of 
death for Taylor, and she's not gonna stop for Kavanaugh being, you know, smarmy asshole and like all this stuff. And she gets it done in that episode. <coughs> Very early on, I think show a lot of her strengths are within the city and like people saying like she didn't go off world or whatever. But when she did go off world, she still showed those strengths. It would have been great if we had a few more episodes like that, and yeah. not just in the first season, interspersed, so we can continue to see the strength of that character in those roles. Okay. I think part of the problem is Weir was initially appointed by Kinsey because he wanted a figurehead. He wanted to put somebody here. in there that he could <laughs> control and be his little puppet. And she was not going to do that. She actually did have a rank, it just wasn't mentioned past the first blonde episode. Because I, I can't remember her name, I'm sorry, but she actually said, told Jack, no, look, I do outrank you. I do have the civilian equivalent that is over you. You will listen to me. I am now your commander. And Kinsey was all kinds of knickers in a twist because he wanted to take over and he was pissed off because he got voted, you know, as vice president and he was trying to discredit the president and the whole surrogate and well, he was evil, so. Oh, Kinsey always had his knickers in a twist yeah. about yeah. something. Um, you mentioned Taylor. We haven't talked about her yet. Um, I think she's pretty cliche and bothersome. Yeah, she has such potential. <laughs> How do you feel about her? That never was uh, realized. She, she, because she's she's not dressed always with an abundance of clothing, um, you know. Like it's it's cut so that it's very figure flattering and everything. Um, she is very powerful. We know that because she can kick people's butts. But she's also always the calm and nurturing, perfect one. So what do you make of that kind of character in all this? But it's in the in her character uh, because she was a leader of her people. She needed to have both. To have both types of a um, skills, like any king or queen of the Middle Ages or pre-Middle Ages, you would need to have a strong warrior quality and strong social quality to, to organize people around with yourself. And she was kind of that type. And I don't think it's my my problem. And again, we talked about weird. My problem with weird character, for example, was. This wasn't a role for her in the in the whole series. And the role it wasn't a role because I'm looking at the series, all three series actually, as a quest game. Um, and uh, there is no character in the quest, which is a negotiator. Um, and the, the reason is that the, the uh, or at least for me the reason is that the uh, you don't have time to negotiate sometimes in this um, in your quests. Quests you like D and D. Yeah. Uh, I always take a bar. They have the highest charisma. It's great uh, to negotiate your way out of a situation. No, I disagree. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're really strong. They, and they give great buffs to your team. I don't know. I can understand that to some extent. I think part of my problem with characters that are more like Taylor is that they just seem a little bit too close to the Mary Sue ideal, you know? They, they don't have enough flaws. I mean, yes, she has a natural hatred of rape, okay? So, who doesn't? <laughs> who wants to be eaten, really? Yeah. I mean, that, that's it? That's all you got? <laughs> and, and she just walk around spouting strange wisdom and not really adding much. It's like the fortune cookie yeah. at Dojin. Yeah. I mean, what is that? <laughs> and, and, and she did not lose sexuality and the form fitting and all that. It just, she didn't lose anything to me. She, she, was, she was not a great fighter. She was not, she's not crazy sexy. It may not have worked she was, for you, but. It, it was just. She was very sexy. It was just this, this character who walked around and said, like, it reminded me in The Expendables, every time they went to Mickey Rourke, he'd be sitting in the, in the uh, tattoo parlor behind the, the lamp of philosophy, and he would say, like, sometimes you know when the cards are down, the cards are actually up in the air. I'm like, I don't know what that means, <laughs> but you just said it behind the lamp of philosophy to make you work, and she did the same thing. And like, wow, thank you so much for adding that strong woman. I mean, I mean that. All right. You haven't spoken yet. I was going to say, Taylor was kind of sort of like the moral voice, though. I mean, sometimes when things were going on, she would be like, are you sure about this? You know, she didn't actually say it that way. It was just the way she would question me. But she sat back so far a lot of times, yeah, it felt yeah. like, 
Like, she was set up like a leader of her people, and she was like all this stuff going for her, and then she'd just be a follower. And I was really surprised after the way that they set her up that they would just leave her to do nothing. Yeah, they could have made her a better fighter or something, or, or I don't know, she could hunt well. I don't know, give her some, some kind of cool skill. Like, when you take her to a planet, like, we need to track her. We really need something Didn't awesome. Didn't she do that? Like, I think she had all those skills. They just, like, never, they never showed used them. them. They never used <laughs> them. It's like, like we, we have a ranger in our team. We will say what skills We're she has and then never hear from her again on those. Okay, we have a hand in the back. It's been up for a while. No, that's you. That's you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, it looked like it was a couple feet. Whatever. Um, I was wondering, because it did. her setup was very warrior-like. I thought at the very beginning that she was going to be the teal. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know, maybe the writers or the producers didn't think it was working. I'm just wondering, question to the panel or the room, do you think that's why they brought in Ronan? Yes. I, I think they decided to kind of, like, hedge bets and go for a maximum audience by getting Jason Momoa and her and say, okay, this is Teal times two. Here you go. <laughs> exactly. I don't know why, but I was happy when they brought Ronan in. I mean, you for obvious why. reasons. <laughs> it's, it's a mystery. Sure you know. <laughs> we may never know. I don't know if going to solve Jeez. that one. Your Ronan Bird was going to have male sexuality. Yes, he used that See? as a weapon. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> Case key point. If you think of Mira Frillian and her role, here's an example of somebody from another culture who was a big star in Czechoslovakia, but because of her different culture when she came to America, she has some very limited opportunities for playing who she really is, and it's really messed her up. And part of being a foreigner in a culture is that you don't. Sometimes you're driving a cab even if you have a PhD and whatever. So, because that, because you know, our culture has its own uh, gatekeepers and we don't want to have too much competition. So uh, when I saw her come in, remember she was the daughter, wasn't she? She was being, and we don't know what kind of leadership style that group had, but they didn't look like they were technologically oriented folks. I saw them more as, more like indigenous people, kind of tribe and, uh, so that makes their leadership style different. So that, I think that's one reason you don't see her. She, she plays the same kind of role that uh, on Star Trek, I can compare to uh, the next generation, the counselor, Deanna Troy. Mm -hmm. She plays Deanna Troy with, with, with less clothes and with a little more muscle. But Deanna Troy is expected to like go on you know as many trips and expected to be but kicking when necessary too, and I, I don't know. I have to disagree with that slightly, because with your average person that someone just randomly picks up from another culture who comes into your culture, you don't normally kind of make them part of the Atlantis team right yeah. off. You know, that that was kind of a little bit different. But they needed somebody who understood. They need someone who understood that. that well, yeah, but then you just call them in for a meeting, and they're like, "All right, thanks. Um, you've consulted. See you later." You know, it's, it's like, no, nope, we're going to plant her right here in the middle of our team. I don't know what she's, she's doing. Can't you get a full time job anymore? Yeah. yeah what does she do the whole time? Like, uh, like she's she's the daughter of a tribe leader or whatever, right? So she could like be out like leading people and doing things that are important. She and instead like, she's like hanging out in Atlanta doing nothing. She got into like Jenga or something. What is Taylor Swift like, book like? Like today, uh, met for breakfast, uh, trained, um, did something for five more. hours while looking at traffic. She writes the most amazing um, blog. Went off to Can't you be a good follower? Planet. Don't you need followers? Too? Sure, I just didn't expect her to be one when she came on the show. Oh. Yeah. Like, if I had ex if I'd seen that, like, Teal. Teal's definitely a follower, you know, and that, make, and that makes sense. Until until he's a leader later, I mean, you know you know what I mean. You, know what I you mean? grow into that. Um, but not at first he was The issue is that her introduction and what she actually was were, we're so, so different. different. Yeah. Did we have a she's hair for a long time? Okay. Right here, she's had her hand for yeah. okay. yeah. so, it. Taylor, first, she was, you know, I think they tried to make her all the all Athosians in one person. She tried, they yes. tried to have her all represent Athosians, <laughs> you know, all of Athosian culture in one character too much. And she's also the, the kind of local guide for the primary Atlantis team. You know, she would know first-hand knowledge about the plants they were going to, about these cultures. So she was 
kind of the local guide. Here's, you know, that's what these people are like. I, you know, that's what this, these folks are like. So, and that's common in military too. You've got locals to help you out to serve yeah. as a mediator. But you don't really put them as in part of your decision making team. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and she never really yeah. grew past it, the cliche role in a, a Western where you bring out a Native American to help yeah. with the lay of the land. And occasionally you okay, walk so around she's and you wisdom. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, kind of. Well, she, she walks around. Taylor, she, don't she, go gives down. You, she, she gives you a lay of the land. She gives you yeah. little bits of inspirational wisdom. They never grew her past that role. And it was very sexist and, and racist and as well. The corner hasn't spoken yet. I would agree with you. Um, it's obvious if we're making parallels between the two teams, they're trying to set her up as the David Jackson, excuse me, David Jackson, giving her the cultural knowledge yeah. so that she should be able to relate the team to the surrounding area. But I totally agree that they just failed at really the yeah. work. Yeah. Well, she doesn't have the book background that Daniel does. That's kind of essential to being. Yeah, but that's just counting. That that's just counting all the knowledge that she would have had passed down orally through tradition, yeah. and that's a great deal of knowledge and wisdom that she would have had. And it felt like even more racist than it did sexist to me that she was some sort of minority that couldn't quite you know, catch up to speed. That's how I always took that, and I was bothered by that. Mm -hmm. I was the first. You look excited. I take so much extension in that because <laughs> uh, I have been doing a rewatch, and I already love Taylor anyway, but one thing I've been noticing is that there's all these moments where, A, she she has John Shepard's ear, and she has a way of guiding him towards best decisions sometimes, and B, she has, like, she's very quick. She's a very fast learner. She, there's moments like in Epiphany, in Aurora, and uh, I think it was in the Brotherhood, or no, Letters from Pegasus, where she's got like this scientific knowledge or this quick mind about something, and like she has moments with Rodney where mm -hmm. he's like surprised at how well she's able to pick something up. And so I think that, you know, I think maybe like from the pilot episode, they, they had this thing that they set out to do with her, and then they changed it because they wanted to take her in a different direction, is be better with her. And I think that. People saw that in that first episode and just kind of maybe took it and ran with it and didn't really pay much attention to her for the rest of the show. Well, it would be interesting using her uh, or a native skill set and the amount of wisdom that she had and explore further. And she was able to catch on to uh, medical things and scientific discoveries and so forth. And that she actually was able to advise the science team because she comprehended these just at a very root level so well that she could just mm -hmm. casually say, well, you may want to add beta particles to this. Like, well, I overheard him saying that it causes a certain reaction, so I want to try it. That would be really interesting if she went in that direction, just at a very root level, just through wisdom that she was, and, and raw intellect, she was able to add more to the team. I just didn't see enough of that. That would have been a really, really much more empowering and interesting character. Go ahead. Um, actually, when I was watching the series, I looked at the uh, relation between Tower and us of people, and the two Asians as a Romans barbarians, um, but <laughs> barbarians, friends, friendly but barbarians. Um, we know they are lower, lower steps, but still, with their ro royalty, their upper class, mm -hmm. is coming in our fold, and we kind of bringing them in and teaching them our way, so they can advance to the next level. And that's where, where I think the picking up, that's where the show is, show her picking up the, the technical stuff and scientific stuff. It's kind of, we were folding her in our culture, our technology to bring her up. Because this was her first that's time. An excellent, like, that's an excellent parallel. I don't know if we really want to go into the, necessarily like, the whole concept of um, our culture is superior to yours, so now we're bringing superior, you out of the Dark Ages thing. Superior. Romans didn't say they were superior, never said they were superior. Yeah, they did. They well, were, if you're yeah. bringing someone up, that means they were down in the first place. Romans defined themselves by Roman and other. Yeah. 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 So They're yeah. not superior, they're just others. And they, 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 they <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, let me just make a quick note. Uh, it is currently 1225, and we have not even mentioned the universe yet. So it's I think okay. we should I've got it's okay. take a couple, <laughs> just a couple of minutes to open that up, um, and like a tiny note, Jennifer Keller, yes, no, I don't know, quick thought. 
What I thought was interesting about Taylor is that in the beginning she was kind of like the weir of the illusions, and I think that's why she was brought into the fold so quickly. And then weir went away and Keller came in and she was so whiny on that trip when she went to go get the vaccines and they find out that all the effusions are gone and Taylor stepped up and basically just said, stop your bitching and let's get going. I, I, I get that you're hurt, but if you don't pick it up, they're going to eat you. <laughs> yeah, um, I think she had a few problems, that character. So I, I think that if they had pulled that side of Taylor, because it was only like that one episode where she really just kicked ass. And it was what you were waiting to see the whole series, and it was one episode. Such a power vacuum that they had to bring in Sam. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where. All right, fine. We'll do that. <laughs> okay, uh, final bits on the females in universe. I think we can all agree that Chloe is went annoying. dramatically awry as a <laughs> female character. I'm not going to say strong. Um, what are your as thoughts on that? <laughs> yes, as a person. <laughs> so, were there any character, female characters that came out of universe that you said, you know, okay, I can handle her? No. I kind of like the men. Nobody liked the men either. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> yeah. It was bad. Not even Yuna's <laughs> character? Because I actually kind of didn't mind her so much. I mean, she went through the whole If you're going to marginalize, do it thoroughly. Right. But at least she stood up to, to the military. And said, that, you know, there are civilians on the, on the ship, too. But she was and so And, like, looked out for her crowd. Yeah. But she it was better, but it was... She didn't crazy. look out for him, though. She, she had the IEO thing. I can't remember the... IEA. Thank you. She had their, their concern. And she was working with Rush, trying to undermine the military. The military just was special. And the, the Chloe just pissed me off because Eli is, like, in love with her, and she leads him along and just keeps stretching it out and stretching it out, and I just wanted to go, Kinsh! I want to thank you all for not, not bringing up the controversy of the sex scene involving the stones that people switch bodies in, in the universe, because I really do not want to talk about that. <laughs> Um, so I'm just thanking you in advance before it comes up. That's just not being mentioned right now because that's a whole can of worms. So I don't know. Like I feel like I can't even talk about like sexism of the characters because I'll, I just like there's so much other stuff that's happening there. Yeah. There's so <laughs> much wrong that so we don't have time to specify. <laughs> I mean, there were good points. Okay, there were a few good points in the universe. And in the later okay. part like of the last alien. season, <laughs> <laughs> in the later part of the last season, where they actually had to establish themselves as humans that were not on a damn ship all the time and, and annoying the crap out of each other, then, you know, you could see them growing into at least something. But, of course, then that was like, and we're done. So, and speaking of which, I mean, have any final thoughts? Because we've got one minute. <laughs> no, just thanks, everyone, for coming. Having a good conversation. I like it when Anya is participating. And see. <laughs> <laughs> one, one last thing. Think of, the, think of who the protagonists are in the evolution of the shows and how you went from eventually the most powerful bad guys, in many cases, were female. You know, the daughter. There were some, the yeah, definitely. Even Andrea. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, thank you both thank for you being so here. Yes, thank you.